for accepting uh, the invite almost immediately and agreeing to come on Sunday. So the session is on concerns uh, on governance with startups, and we are largely talking. We are talking about funded startups, big companies, a lot of employees, a lot of money, uh, consumer of uh, national resources, and uh, dealing with a lot, lot of stakeholders. So we are talking about large funded startups, and we use the word startups. So uh, before we begin, I would like to introduce Ramki uh, in as short and brief. Uh, but without missing the punch, um, because there are a lot of lot of things to talk about Ramki. So Ramki is a good friend, and uh, he's a CA, ACMA, and ACS, and comes with close to three decades of experience, 27 to be precise, uh, of multi-sector background. He's been in manufacturing, he's been IT, IT, yes, consulting and services industries. He started his career in uh, corporate finance, almost like a dream start. We all back then would have always liked to get into corporate finance of all roles in finance. And has extensive experience, therefore, in controllership and finance operations and setting up back office functions for large entities. Uh, Ramki has been on a board, uh, on board and the risk committee of many corporates, uh, including listed entities and has been advising companies on corporate governance as part of the growth journey, including IPO bound companies. Ramki was awarded the top 100 uh, CFOs in the country twice by CFO India magazine in 2015 and then again in 2021. Um, Ramki runs his own consulting firm uh, with his own name, Ramki Consulting, and is also a partner at CFO Bridge. And that's where Ramki and me are colleagues, as I'm also a partner with Safe Bridge. And so that's Ramki. Ramki, so there are other facets which Ramki did not share in the short bio. I will uh, let out those secrets also. Uh, Ramki is a great athlete, athlete, and he done uh, runs, I think, a half marathon almost uh, once a week, is it? Or once a week or once a month? No, once no, a week. That's that's a week. Once a week. So he runs a half Can marathon you... once a week. So I used to say, I used to how to orient us. <laughs> because I used to say with a lot of pride that I run 10 kilometers and I have run a half marathon. But since I heard from him once over a coffee that he runs a half marathon once a week, I have stopped speaking about that. You know, so I think uh, there's a long, long way to go. So Ramki, great to have you here. And uh, uh, me and Ramki will be doing this sessions more, you can call it a fire chat or a conversational manner. Um, and the idea is to uh, dig deep into Ramki's experience of uh, working with uh, large companies on the one hand, and therefore his great awareness of and the governance standards there, and his consulting experience with not so large companies, and therefore, his knowledge of what those companies lack. So therefore, it's a it's a perfect uh, blend of uh, having worked early part of his life in companies with thick uh, governance structure, with deep governance structure, and now working with companies where he's advising them on what you know, governance structure they should have. Um, I do also advise a lot of startups. So therein, I thought that in our interaction, we could bring out some of those issues um, a little deeply. Yeah. So, so Ramki, the, uh, let's set the context straight away. And uh, we're essentially going to talk about the governance um, concerns in the funded startups. And uh, since we are talking to a team of uh, fraud fighters, what are the associated red flags? What are the concern areas that you can pick up when you look at some of them? Or with what should the board do? What is the duty of the board in such companies? Is there a board at all beyond just the, uh, you know, the the shareholder board? You know, is there a independence in the board? Let me put it that way. And what they need to do, and what as responsible citizens the uh, the board and the CEO need to do about the company, right? So that's essentially the backdrop. And uh, while we discuss some of the concerns and some of the individual cases, I think the deeper discussion is not so much on the individual cases per se, but more on the uh, likelihood, as I said earlier, you know, the the red flags and uh, 
the really issues had been across companies, not just with one of the companies. Uh, and the reason for that is uh, we see that in companies that uh, there is a lot of uh, stress uh, on governance with uh, listed companies and SEBI coming into the way as well. So one is the Companies Act and the other is SEBI. They've really raised the bar as far as the governance in listed company goes. Uh, but in private company, is still somewhere in between a, a glorified proprietorship and something that is slightly becoming a little beyond that. So we'll just try to cover that aspect. So we know a lot of governance standards on public companies and listed entities like, you know, the mandatory committees like audit committees, the uh, nomination remuneration committees, CSR, stakeholder committees, etc. They're, they're mandated by law. And most of them have to be headed by an independent director. Uh, while, uh, while in private companies, there is absolutely no such rule. So, so that's on the one side, the, you know, your earlier experience with companies would have been where you would have, you know, worked with such companies. And then uh, there's no such rule for private company startups. So you could have a 1,000 crore company, which is, on NSC, following every rule on the book, and then you have a 1,000 crore company working with private capital, practically not following any law on the earth. Or rather, the law is not framed for them. I should not say that they are not practicing law. I take back my words. Not much uh, statute is there to mandate any governance for the second type of company, right? So uh, with that, I'll try to go to the first question uh, or the first point. What should be the right governance stance and the right governance orientation for a private company, given that its primary focus would be to grow the top line, you know, uh, multiply its revenue five times, ten times, etc. Being given that will be the primary focus, um, what do you think would be the right governance stance for such companies? Uh, or mind you, these so called startup companies are not. I'm not talking about one crore, two crore company. I'm talking about companies that have raised thousands of crores of private capital and they're consumers of national resources and employ a large number of employees and deal with multiple stakeholders, with MSME sectors, et cetera, et cetera. So given all that, what according to you is the uh, uh, right governance framework for such companies? Over to you. Thank you, uh, Mani. Um... Hope I'm audible. Uh, that's the first thing I just. Yeah, yeah thank you. So I think um, you know. First of all, thanks to you and thanks to ACP Hyderabad chapter for inviting me. Uh, great session, uh, especially governance, one of my favorite topics, uh, and which I've been working on for a few decades now. Uh, seen variety of you know governance structures both in startup uh, companies which are at a startup stage getting to the next stage and moving to the uh, public market stage and of course fully public listed uh, companies. Uh, well, I think uh, you know the ideal scenario you know and this is something theoretical and an ideal scenario would be to say that you know make sure you have a very strong board of directors with subcommittees. Uh, make sure you have a good, uh, strong external internal auditor. Um, you know, one of the big four being the stat auditor, very, very strong <laughs> ERP, um, you know, highly professional senior management uh, with the CEO, CFO, CHRO. These are prescriptions, right? And, and more often than not, uh, you know, if you have a tick in all these boxes, um, you know, there's a good chance that uh, things won't go wrong, ideally. Now, obviously, how many of them would be, first of all, affording this? Because I think I'm not straight away going to target only, uh, you know, the fund, you know, fully funded, you know, multiple rounds funded startups. There are fund startups who are probably in the early incubation stage, who are probably just rising the Series A or probably the Series B. And then there are obviously, you know, the fully grown startups. So, you know, let's look at the entire gamut. And that's what I would recommend, right? So is it practical? Is it something a promoter will be willing to do? Uh, whatever we prescribe, uh, the answer is a very clear one, right? Um, and, and looking at uh, what, so what is the ideal approach? Uh, the ideal approach always is to kind of focus on two graphs. 
one graph obviously which 100% the promoter would focus is the growth graph so definitely you know the startup will be looking at how i grow my business what are the things i do to make sure my revenue grows my profitability grows and obviously which means my valuation grows that's focus you need not tell for sure most of the startups oh. are definitely going to look at that now obviously the other graph which comfortably gets completely overseen is the governance graph now we are not going to say that this governance graph needs to be in the radar on day one i think it's highly impractical like i said mm. even yeah. this even the smallest of governance will not be in your radar and that's practical mm. so let's mm. kind of say that you know it's it's not something which will automatically happen uh, but i think over a period of time you know as you start growing as you start building your business as the growth happens and at some point in time you get your let's say your series a funding and i know just before that i think it's time when you kind of feel you know as a promoter you will feel that yes i think i've reached a stage where i think i can go and get some external funding i can do this i can also go for the next round of funding that's the time you slowly start shifting your focus also to the governance graph now the other thing is also to say all of those governance items which we prescribed initially at the start of the discussion to be you know the tick box to be there on each one of those on day one highly impractical yes, game again no promoter yeah. will do that so let's slowly try to build the governance graph right you take one item for a year or two items for a year start focusing only on those you know it could be and also yeah. the other thing is eventually what is the end game strategy of a startup that's another thing which is very important is the end game strategy a simple exit then i think they would still be hesitant to focus on the governance graph but if the end game strategy is to let's say have true, you know true. good growth with high pe valuations eventually wanting to go either to private equity or to the public markets be it the you know sme board or the main board then you have no choice in the matter but to definitely look at the absolutely graph, right because that's the end game and yeah, this is yeah. something to one big issue which i have noticed with the companies i have seen is that they definitely want to look at the governance graph but very late in the game after having yeah. decided that i want to go and hit the public markets or after having decided mm -hmm. that i want to go for private equity at that point in time there is a rush to say how can i change the system from a excel to this erp how can i get some external compliance how can i get some external cfo cfo chro mm -hmm. i mean there's a sudden rush of activity in one shot and that won't work that's a prescription again for failure because you may probably able to position yourself that you have a professional setup just for the funding mm. round but post that you will figure out that things will crumble so that's the reason i'm saying as the growth graph keeps growing steep the graph on the governance may not grow as steep but slowly starts creeping up that's the way you need to build it so take one item in a year mm. don't try mm. to swing the pendulum which is what you know when you try to do all those stick in the boxes one yeah, year yeah. being the problem try to take baby steps and try no. to do one step at a year and then you will definitely hit where you need to hit it could be various yeah. things this year i focus on just internal control systems next year i probably focus on slowly you know kind of changing the composition of the board uh, you know it could also be that at some point in time i cannot still afford a full fledged cfo or a chro but i get something like an outsource cfo or an outsource chro so that they bring in fresh eyes they bring That's in external points controls yeah. and stuff like that yeah. so yeah. you try to build the ecosystem and in such a way if you have an individual as an auditor remove the individual bring a firm i am not saying firm should be a big four there are auditors much beyond big four in this country even Absolutely. if you have auditors in the most of the big issues we've had in startups are all audited by big four so I, you know i have no exactly. use on that right but at least from having an individual auditing your company have a firm of auditors auditing the company what's the difference the difference is at least there is a peer review there is some peer there review done partner who's ready yeah. to look at what the first partner is saying so like this you take baby steps and then slowly mm. we get to where you need to get so i will stop there money mm. as you know first start and then no, no, it's an excellent brief actually excellent excellent opener from you ramkin kind of hit the nail on the head especially when you said the simple steps and the baby steps only my wild liner there is the baby steps should 
uh, as a child, you know, age of the step should also become a little longer over time. If you can remain the baby steps uh, as it was at one point of time. And I like the point which you mentioned that this was a great point, actually, because many people think, are wo karna hai, matlab KMP lagana hai, CFO lena hai. It's not so. You're, you're absolutely bang on the head. You can always get a help, a fractional CFO service is as good to a small company as a full CFO service. For the needs that it has got, fractional CFO service is more than enough. Right? At least then you're bringing some professionalism into the game. You know, things like revenue recognition and people practices and certain of ESOPs to get a good ESOP policy design. Yeah, I, I completely, completely agree with you there. Uh, but uh, one question I have, and you mentioned private capital. Uh, this is my view, and uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. I would, uh, I think a few years back, I would have thought if I am getting a private investor, I am talking about an institutional investor. I'm not talking about an angel, uh, Ramki investing in my company as a friend. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking a Sequoia, some institutional investor coming in. I would presume that the governance mandate to be driven a lot by the institutional investor because it is his own interest also. Because he's coming into a company owned by me. Now, he will like to do a lot of DD prior to coming in and after also he would like to ensure that the company grows well. But what I am seeing, and uh, I'm not telling you this, that is, the, uh, that is true in every single case, but what I see is even the institutional investors have a funnel vision of a few years, uh, except barring a few, uh, barring a few. And that vision is only aimed to maximizing the value of the company, say, in the next five or seven years, so that they can have a good exit. They are not thinking like Tata's 100 years ahead, right? So that's that's one problem. So maybe we should soon, soon realize, and that's my view again, as I said, correct me if I'm wrong, that just having an institutional investor does not mean that your governance uh, is is robust, you know. Uh, it doesn't mean. Would you would you agree to that? Uh, totally agree. Totally agree. And okay. especially more so if it is a financial investor, right? Because financial right. investors understand they are not having funds of their own. They in turn have further funds. There are people who funded them, and there are obligations for these financial investors to go back and settle over a period of time. It could be a three-year fund, it could be a five-year fund, it could be a fund specific for a particular investment. So obviously, when the returns are kind of you know kind of guaranteed by the fund to the third party. And also when they are trying to see downstream with the startup saying that boss, I would like to look at this return. So there is pressure mounting across the channel in terms of making sure the returns happen. And that's your primary focus, right? Mm, yes, yeah. that's, that's bound to happen. And you know, in between the startup while could have a lot of things going, headwinds going its way, you know, in sense mm. like its business model, uh, you know, its product, its technology, uh, you know, all that could be great. But there could be other things which may also come in its way. It could be economic changes, it could be political, mm. geo, you know, mm. geopolitical changes, it could be anything. Now, those are things which could potentially disrupt the journey of a startup. But what happens parallelly with the investor is at the end of the day, they are still looking at some of those numbers and some of those returns still coming in within this time period. And that's when, you know, a lot of things go out of hand. Then compliance yeah. starts going out, uh, how we make the numbers come to the forefront. And then, you know, whatever we're seeing in the public domain on some of the issues we've had, even with some of the large Investors and mm. one particular investor yeah. is involved with at least four big startups, uh, and, and mm. things happen. Mm. So uh, you are absolutely right, man. There's no doubt about that. You know, just because I have yeah. an investor, it doesn't mean. On the other hand, if it's a strategic investor, the chances correct. are better. the chances yeah, are because like, strategy, yeah, correct. Yeah, because you know they would like to look at it more from a strategy perspective. How would yeah. help grow their business also because strategically it's a fit for you rather than just correct. a financial. Correct. Absolutely, absolutely. So that's again a point which we all need to keep in mind. Just having a PE or a VC in the company does not elevate the governance uh, substantially. It may elevate a bit. Uh, maybe they'll get a finance guy, but then again, that finance guy would be furthering their interests, probably not the interests of the firm. 
so there have been some interesting conversations and interesting interesting irregularities and interesting conversations around those um i will not mention the name but i'm sure people understand uh, with respect to one uh, company where there was some irregularity which necessitated the removal of the of the founder from the company and the interesting response was i built a company from scratch you know and how can someone question so this is the proprietary mindset which is uh, some private companies still probably follow that proprietary mindset that you know it's my company i am the owner in spite of the fact that you have multiple investors and also a fairly uh, independent board uh, in this case right and the second case is even more interesting uh, with a company ceo saying that yeah, yeah you know we made some mistake we got to carry the way and we got to passionate about growing top line hence we over reported numbers i do not know when uh, passion really has equated uh, financial fraud at least uh, i have not known in my life so now this conversation and this remarks to my mind is a result of a belief uh, with these guys rightly or wrongly that it's a private company and you are not on the stock exchange therefore nobody can question you you can run it the way you want and this goes back to the you know first question i asked so the governance so first of all let's dwell on this why do you think these incidents has happened with funded companies and a lot of them are happening by the way and uh, what is it driving we learned in the morning session uh, on ethics that uh, the human greed is the cause of most of the things so is it only that or is it a confidence that i can do anything and there's nobody to question which is uh, kind of evidence from the replies of the kind of responses that i spoke to you earlier and who is responsible and are there any loopholes in the regulatory system that is or uh, are they taking shelter under the fact that there is uh, no governance expected of me and therefore i can get away with with, with anything so why do you think these irregularities or this kind of financial statement fraud so even the other frauds happen in these companies i think completely agree with uh, I, i mean i was not a privy to the morning speaker but i think this you know human greed Uh, it could be from the perspective of the promoter it could be a combination of promoter plus investor or it could be you know just the investor which were way okay but i think that's kind of driving more or less the behavior pattern right obviously like the focus like i said is on driving the revenues driving your profits and eventually driving the valuations now what is yeah. that that's that's nothing you know other than human greed it's important you need to have a respiration no doubt uh, sure. you know we are not the people in business are not saints uh, you know they need to have their aspirations no doubt but over aspiring than what you have to deliver you know as in you have a product or a solution which can deliver x result but if you kind of aspire to achieve something like about 15x 20x within a particular year or within a particular time frame that's where the difference happens uh, and that's what yeah, you're you stretching know, it yeah, yeah. And, and you know you spoke about some of the examples and you know some of the issues which are brought up, but see how basic they are. I mean, it's not that yeah. you know the investor invested in the company thinking they are manufacturing auto components, but actually they are into pharmaceuticals. It's not like that. I mean, <laughs> absolutely. You no, know, these are basics. You know, basics in terms of revenue recognition. Revenue recognition. Uh, basic absolutely. in terms of you know uh, the the say, the growth in the business. doesn't correspond to the revenue growth which is shown in the books of accounts your centers don't grow by a big number but your revenue grows by a mega number <laughs> it just doesn't match so where is the revenue coming from uh, in some cases you know we are talking about and again as i keep quoting you will be pretty much be able to correlate what i'm saying you know in case where it's milestone based you recognize uh, you know the revenue even before the milestone is met and and then obviously your yeah. revenues are highly inflated uh, and then you know at some point in time you figure out that there's an issue uh, there is a third case where uh, you know you have uh, generated uh, you know artificial or non existent vendors and you make payments to those non existent vendors in huge amounts and uh, you know those are vendors who are probably you know third parties who are somewhere correlated to the promoters uh, so it could be mm. patent misuse of accounting 
or it could be frauds or it could be greed and a combination so uh, you know there are various things which are currently driving some of these things and it's not something which is like you know i invested thinking this will happen but the business failed miserably those also happen i am not saying this yeah, absolutely yeah, that happen. and that could happen even in a listed company why should it not yeah. happen you know it can happen even in listed companies you know where yeah, yeah. you go horribly wrong in a in a quarter in a you know you know it can things can change you know the yeah. pandemic changed the complete history of a lot of companies they became non existent now that's not in your hands but to have revenue recognition issues uh, payment to <laughs> non existent vendors uh, aggressive yeah. revenue recognition not filing annual statements for 2 3 years right and yeah. and by the way all these are companies which are invested by some of the big investors and audited mm. by the way by the big firms so yeah so Sure, it's not sure. necessarily that it gives you the immunity if some of these boxes are ticked but it's a question of the dna and the hygiene which you decide to follow on day one which is why i come back to my original point in asking what's your end game strategy is your end game strategy exiting the business in the next couple of years or is your end game strategy really growing the business unlocking the value taking it to the next level you will still make money it's not that you should not make money but what is your end game strategy i think that will yeah. primarily determine uh, you know the behavioral pattern if i may go yeah yeah there are a lot of questions on the chat i'll take them guys uh, hold on i'll just take all those questions but i'll just ask one more question which is very close to my heart that may answer some of by the way the questions you have put up um, and then i'll come back individually again to those so so given uh, the you know the what is it right see we all agree that uh, in india especially people need a nudge to be compliant sorry to say that um we need a nudge if there is a red light and um, um okay let me start with this if there are no traffic lights i'm sure there will be um, anarchy on the streets right i don't think someone will wait for the other person to cross and i'll let me go further even if there is a red light and nobody is watching still there will be an arc in the car still there are no traffic on the other side so therefore well that's the another extreme but let's come back to the basic governance first at least there is some expectation of sanity when you have some checks in place so given that and given that you usually need a nudge to be compliant to be seen as proper uh, what do you think uh, you know the regulators in this case private company probably sebi is not active because it's not there are no minority shareholders in this company so let's not get technical with sebi but do you think there should be some regulatory nudge let me give an example you know in companies act um uh if you have i think more than 200 shareholders in number each share each guy can hold a 100 rupee share right still just by a sheer number if you are more than 200 you get into a something called a public company public unlisted company and then of course when you list you become a listed company right so now that's there so there are some compliance uh, particular way in which you are appointed a managing director you can pay him only so much then you need to have the committees on the board as i said i am not saying that with all this frauds don't happen i'm not going there i'm not even talking about what might happen even if you have this but at least there is a semblance of discipline right so now what do you think from uh, the statutory authority or the regulator point of view should there be a nudge on this massively invested private companies which could have a handful of share the handful of shareholders only maybe four or five but then the amount invested could be about 1000 crores right and they are massively invested companies employing a lot of people so in every sense of the term there could be a listed company with 1000 crore and there could a private company as i said earlier with 1000 crore but there is a heaven and hell difference in the governance standard between these two so do you think there is a case for a uh, independence of board to be mandated to be uh, some uh, changes in the corporate law or some regulatory authority to kind of mandate some standards not these guys into becoming a better corporate citizens well i think uh, you know there was some step taken when the companies act 2013 happened a lot of the 
provisions which were generally otherwise applicable for public companies were also correct of the private companies which was i think 2013 change. has done it i yeah. think secretary yeah. 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 of the company like 2013 it started somewhere yeah. around yeah. became yeah. effective more from 2015 and beyond right that's right that's now right. what happens is you know you, you're you're spot on actually but you know if you look at the growth trajectory of the startups uh, as in that ecosystem uh, in the last let's say 3 5 years uh, you know it's been phenomenal you know yeah, mm. I'm sure there are a lot of speakers who have covered the startup ecosystem in the country and the number of unicorns and stuff like that. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's no longer uh, the scenario, even those when those enactments happened in 2013-15, even at that time, we didn't have all this, right? Uh, but, uh, yeah. you know, uh, but post that, if you see the kind of growth has been phenomenal, which means the regulators have, and if you look at the regulatory changes after 2013 amendment, right? It has not necessarily been the greatest. And I will take some cues from what you mentioned, Mary. Very simple. If you take a listed company, you know, they are bound by the SAP LODR agreement, which is both yeah. the stock exchange and also by the company side and the SAP. Right. Right? So right. there is enough and more monitoring on them. On a, even on a particular day, simple when your stock price moves you know more than regular there is a yeah, red, there is a mail which break, immediately right? comes back from the exchange saying what has happened in your company today to say that the stock price has moved so much is there anything positive is there anything negative both positive and negative okay oh, yeah. get, same day evening you get the mail okay yeah. now that's the level at which you are being monitored right now of course but still that there are things going wrong that's a different matter that's another issue yeah we will yeah, not go there yeah but the possibility is less but think about it for a minute. Who is the investor in invested company? It could be, you know, retail, forget it. Yeah, I mean, that's always there everywhere. But there are yeah. FIs, there are DIs, and there are big, huge institutional investors who are right. investing. QIBs and all that. On the private side, which we are talking about, who are the investors? Now, again, these are institutional investors. Now, on right. who is invested in those institutions could again be, you know, further institutions or it could be other international investors. So eventually the end party to whom the governance needs to be reported could almost probably end up the same, right? You know, or at least right. you know, a fraction of it could be the same. So right. when you look at the regulatory standard, it's extremely, like you said, very high on the listed environment and relatively not so high on the unlisted environment or on the private environment. And more so still akin to, you know, probably a 2013 or 2015 environment post which there's a mega change, right? So mm. you're bang on. I think the regulators definitely need to put in more clamp on the startups in terms of their reporting requirements. And hence, you know, will probably bring in more moral responsibility. Even today with listed companies, you know, before anything happens, now they kind of always think through, hey, this will be questioned by the board. This will be questioned yeah. by the board. Yeah. Nothing of that discussion comes anywhere close to that when we go into a startup. You know, just True. get on to growth and this will help our numbers. This will help our valuation. Those are the discussions, but it never yeah. discussed even for a minute on some of those governance. So you're bang on. I think some of those regulatory changes are required. Uh, and what those are, like I said, if the regulator comes back, the biggest issue with our regulator again, is that they swing the pendulum. They don't take baby steps, mm. right? So yeah. from this, if you're, uh, and, and the other good point which you brought is the 200 people. Now that's kind of, you know, quite uh, archaic if you ask me. Uh, you know, rather I would look at what is your investment. Money. Look what's, at the investment size, yeah. Yeah, what's the investment threshold? Have you generated investment beyond a particular pattern? And you can have slabs like your income tax slab. You know, up to this investment threshold, you need to have Absolutely. at least this product. Yeah. Beyond that, you need to have additional couple of things. So that yeah. way, you know, the startups will one be of a size which they will be able to afford some of these, uh, you know, governance standards. And two, it will also give the investor and the, you know, the promoter that ability to slowly scale up. You know, I've scaled up, I made money. I also am responsible to answer to a few people. I think, you know, it will it'll balance well rather than, you know, kind of putting everything on day one or not putting anything at all. So correct. I totally agree correct. with you. Correct, correct. I think at this point, let me take some questions there so that we um, are quite uh, up to date with the questions on the, the chat box. So uh, Satish, my dear friend, has started off saying, uh, oh, it's Funny's first question, actually. Um, uh, Funny says that things have to happen right at the first point. Governance is 
governance mostly depends on individual integrity. Absolutely. Yeah, but the only we point that briefly, I think, yeah. yeah, we discussed that briefly yeah. in terms of you know greed and individual mindset. Correct. So the tone Correct. has to come from the top. If the tone yeah. doesn't come from the top, you are not going to get it right for sure. Yeah, and and funny to me just to to answer your question, the first part, uh, governance in terms of the intent, yes, as Ramki rightly said, governance not in so much as a structure possibly. No, that's what Ramki said. You can't have a the beginning you can't have a you know high five board and multiple committees intent yes you can always take help from a fractional a cfo or a fractional company secretary or a fraction have a good people supporting you in advisory channel so to that extent yes and that's the baby steps that i think he spoke about ranki but uh, individual integrity point is bang on and uh, satish this question is next good governance in corporate is really required to keep a compliance environment so that the company will not get into legal issues. What do you think? I think it's an emphatic yes. Yeah. And I'm saying absolutely. absolutely yes. Yeah. Absolutely yes. Because yeah. see, in terms of compliance, I don't think there is any room for exactly any day on day one. Okay. There is no question of yeah. growth versus you know uh, governance. What we are discussing about governance is more in terms of putting up a you know, if you internal audit department Absolutely. or, you know, yeah, better yeah. auditor or independent board, that's more governance. But compliance, okay, should I comply with Income Tax Act? Should I comply with Company Act? Should I comply with... Should I file on time? Yeah, I mean, I file, uh -huh. there are two ways about it. Uh, you better start yeah, complaining. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and I often, in fact, uh, um, I was pretty surprised when in the COVID year, or, okay, a little bit of leeway was fine. They kept on extending the time. You know, people are off. All MCA compliances are, by the way, online. The one of the days when you go, I can understand if that were the case, someone walking out, everything is online. You know, and they kept extending. I think, uh, I, I don't think compliance as such, uh, maybe barring some exceptions here and there, should really be a discussion point. That should be, in fact, when I was the compliance at Dramki in uh, Ready Labs, we used to say compliance is not a discussion, it's not a topic. Compliance is a given. That's what we used to say. It's the minimus. It is a given. No, That's the always, least you should do. We anything. always say that compliance needs to be part of your DNA. As much yeah, as business yeah. is your DNA, compliance is part of your DNA. You have no Absolutely choice. right. Absolutely right. So second question, Satish, uh, Compliance is a challenge over and above. Good compliance will contribute to the growth of an organization. Maybe Satish, when he's saying compliance, he means a governance, especially in the second question. So when he says good compliance, obviously, I think he's talking about good governance will contribute to the growth of... I think from a sustainable point of view, sustainability point of view, I think there is a no second opinion to that uh, question. Then there's one more from Funny. For PE investors to achieve the desired results, many of them acknowledge that appropriate governance is entry ticket to the desired result. But unfortunately, they do that till they get in. <laughs> I'm not sure. They do that. Uh, what would you like to say, Ramke? I don't know yeah, what so my I think view he's, he's, he's bang on. Funny is bang on. Yeah, and, course, uh, and, and, uh, right. You know, um, see, what happens is as part of their due diligence checklist, Obviously, they will have all this stuff, right? You know, does the company have board? What is the composition? Auditors, yeah. background, how long they've been there? I mean, a whole bunch of stuff in the due diligence before they put in the money, right? Now, obviously, at that point in time, it's all done, right? And that could be more often than not, I've seen that that could be a 60 40 rule, which is followed. You know, as long as about 60 65% of the due diligence uh, checklist is a, is, a, is a green tick, it's fine. 30 35%. Not necessarily green. Uh, it could be somewhere in between. I think they'll still go ahead because you know they see the mm. value potential, and that's what more mm. often than not happens. They don't expect a hundred percent tick mark necessarily, right? But post coming True. in, that's where the fun starts. When the growth and exactly like what we discussed on the company side, 2013-15, you put in a lot of promotions for private. But if you look at the growth which is there in the startup ecosystem, has the regulator kept pace with what is going on? If the answer is definitely a no. Very similar thing happens here. Has the you know investor kept pace with the governance standards and keep mm. pushing for more governance than the time yeah. when he entered the place? More yeah. often, the people figure out that the answer is, and that's yeah. what. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's all the ownership mindset versus the 
custodian mindset, if I can put that word. I think in if you see a lot of the companies, Tata, I worked uh, there. That was my first job. Uh, I worked with Tata Steel. There is this custodianship. I don't know. Is there a better word? I don't know. But I'm just using a word which comes to my mind. There is a custodian mindset when it comes to the 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 leaders of the company or the board of the company, which is not always about me and my yield, right? I don't think 1907 when they set up Tata Steel, they would have thought that how much profit this company is going to make in the next. 10 years, so that's one extreme that has been known for that. But I think the answer lies somewhere in, in the center of it. Right? You don't have to be so, I guess, custodian-like and, again, not so um, venture-like. <laughs> so I think somewhere it's in the middle. Yeah, so, in fact, yeah. Uh, just, just to kind of add one point quickly, Mani. sorry, I mean, sorry to put in. No, no, please, go ahead. This is all about interaction. But, uh, yeah, you know, I think one of the things when I've seen in advising companies which are kind of going from a promoter to, let's say, a public, and, you know, that uh, obviously we look at three or four important things. We look at people, we look at process, we look at technology, we look at governance framework. These are things we put together, right? Uh, but the biggest challenge, and trust me, the biggest challenge we see is to change the promoter's mindset, right? Now, that is a separate project in itself. Trust me, yeah. because yeah. more often than not, the promoter wants to unlock the value, but still wants to run it like a promoter-driven company, right? Yeah. Not yeah. Be sharing all the data which is required to be shared. Um, even the broader mindset, if you know, when you're taking your company to public from being your own promoter to the company, the biggest thing which happens is as you unlock value, you also share the value, right? Whereas more often than not, the promoter wants most of the value to throw back to him or his own family and relatives. Whereas once mm. you move towards the public domain, it's a question of the mm. more you share, the more you grow and the more value. Yeah. You now that yeah. mindset change takes hell a lot of time. And the same thing happens yeah. even with private investors, right? So when they come in, and when the investor asks for some data, more often than not, I've seen promoters saying, why do we need to share this with him? There's no need to Correct. share this. And no, I think no, yeah. all the accountant will say, just share only this, don't share that portion yeah. of it. Yeah, then slowly things start, that a lot. you know, the friction starts. Uh, and then somewhere, you know, uh, the whole ecosystem starts doubting the stuff. So you're, you're, you're bang yeah. on. I, mean, I, I, I just wanted to add that simple point. You know, no, no, absolutely. Absolutely. I think it is. It, it comes from, I guess, I own the company and uh, it's, it's a very, very private, private company, although he may be a huge company having lakhs and lakhs of employees. And when I say employee, <laughs> in fact, uh, you quoted that with one of the promoters. I started this company from scratch and I know. And I think yeah, it's yeah, the same yeah. thing. Correct. So now one. Um, uh, making it a little more relevant to the uh, anti-fraud community um, in, in, in terms of, uh, not that the earlier one wasn't, in terms of the point which excites them more from drawing a, uh, you know, how would you support, uh, what are the red flags that you will pick and therefore uh, reacting to that, what would be the, um, how would you identify the fraud indicators and hence create that entire you know, anti-fraud policy and uh, take the company forward and uh, insulate the company or shield the company from risks such as that of, uh, you know, bribery, corruption, possibly in conflict of interest, uh, which is, by the way, very, very, I mean, the structures to protect these risks uh, in a private limited company funded or otherwise is pretty brittle in my view. How do you, uh, you know, how do you create governance structures that can protect? First of all, how do you identify? Uh, what are the red flags? And either in some of the cases that you speak to, you already kind of said that, saying that these are to do with some very basic things. But let's go a little deeper. Let's step back if we are not trying to talk only about these cases, generally about funded companies. When we get in, what should be the role? How should we go about um, uh, evaluating the existential risks, probably the sectoral risks, the geopolitical risks, and... Uh, creating a framework, a governance framework, an internal control um, a framework, and probably the three lines of difference that we all talk about. So any views on those things? And just maybe culminate your answer with a view to um, what, are, what are the two or three things that the board needs to do um, with respect to these areas? And with respect to protecting the company from these risks, let me put it that way. 
Sure. So I think, um, you know, bang on. And, and like we said, uh, you know, as we are taking the baby steps to control and stuff like that, let's assume one of the baby steps we have taken is towards putting in a strong internal control system, not even audit, internal control system within the company, right? Now, obviously, one of the things as a you know, board member or as a management or as an investor, if I was investing into the company, apart from the due diligence and stuff like that, which I anyway do at the time of entry, to make right. sure there is sustained focus on some of the critical elements of the company, I will focus on what is the business of the company, right? Now, is the company's focus on a particular area where, let's assume, you know, uh, revenue, right? Uh, I'm just giving an example. I'll give you three, four oh. examples. Uh, like, let's take revenue. So, obviously, one of the things, if you're talking about revenue, I would like to kind of look at it and see, what is the kind of sectoral revenue split? You know, is the startup you know purely focused on one sector or is it multiple sectors? If it is one sector, and if it is highly, highly kind of focused, and you know, let's say ninety-five percent of my revenue comes from one sector and five percent comes from the remaining about eight sectors, let's assume for the high period, concentration risk. Yeah. I will concentrate very heavily on the internal control on those ninety-five percent sector. Right. And I will also point. try to see yeah. over a period of time how I change this pie in such a way that 95% comes down. Not by bringing down the business there, but by growing. Sure, but by growing other, other verticals so that exactly. the pie becomes more spread out. Yeah. Exactly. So that is on sector. Similarly, on geography. Let's assume that you know, I'm extremely focused on you know Europe and uh, my focus on other geographies are absolutely none. Like very scant. Anything mm -hmm. in Asia Pacific. I don't have anything much in India. Very small business domestic. Nothing in the US. Again, that's something which is a red flag. Uh, when I say red flag, it's nothing wrong in it. But then yeah. what happens is, then the broader view in terms of what is happening in Europe, how could potentially a change in some of the things which is happening in Europe affect your business? How do you de-risk your business? What are the controls hmm. that are being put to kind of grow your you know, geographical split towards other areas is something which I will look at. The third thing I will look at is, let's say, customer. If I'm kind of extremely customer centric, what is the customer centricity? Mm. If I have customer centricity beyond, let's say, 12 to 15 percent, I'm dependent on one customer who brings me about, let's say, 80 percent of my revenues. Then I have, a, mm. you know, I definitely have a serious issue. Not that you know I will not invest yeah. in first, but what yeah. I will do is yeah. I will go all out to ensure that see how I do business with that customer. Who is having regular connections with that customer? What is the growth prospect of the customer? Meeting once a week. What, and... is the, what is the tenor of agreements with the customer? Is the longevity yeah. there and stuff like that? Yeah. So these are things just from a revenue perspective. There are other businesses yeah. which I work with where I think nearly about uh, 75, 80% or 85% of it is primarily staff cost. Okay, because they're all people oriented businesses. Yeah, so, KPO type, BPO type, yeah. Yeah, those kind of cases, I would focus very heavily on the staff cost and typically what's your recruitment processes, what's your retention processes, training processes, how do you make sure, you know, the staff cost are and what are the compliances with reference to labor, compliances with reference to PFESI, and so on and so forth. I will pound all those questions and make sure I'm always on top. Typically, I don't want to have, uh, you know, just like one of the startups said, you know, we had revenue numbers which didn't correspond to growth. I don't want, you know, false uh, employee gen records being generated just because I have to show X number of employees at the end of the quarter. Not required. So I just want to make sure that I focus on some of those things. Suppose the startup is heavily focused on R&D, right? Because mm. there are future uh, things, products which are likely to come up, but today it's all... Especially in pharma, life sciences yeah, companies. Exactly. Yeah. In those cases, in I bio, have biotech very, companies very well, heavily yeah. on the R&D spend and what's the impact and what's going to happen. So it depends on the industry. And then I make sure that I ask the right questions for that particular. So I don't want to boil the ocean. I don't want to kind of, you know, kind right, of uh, right. make sure boil the ocean and just focus on all the areas and make sure the businesses, you know, they're not able to focus on yeah. business, but they're not focusing on answering me. That's not the good for me. But at least the critical things which you need to look at for that business, you need to be straight smart to look at it, yeah. number one. Number two, no, absolutely. as a board of director, what are the things that was a, you know, culminating question in terms of what yeah. you, so typically what I do ideally is that, you know, Every quarter, this particular piece which I've identified, one particular piece which I've identified, 
I would like to see an update every quarter, which is an in-depth study, not just looking at financial, not just looking at projections for the next quarter or the end of the year. Rather, I would look at what has happened here in this particular piece, which I want to know and get deep dive into it and get some degree of comfort, put in some action items which need to be done, follow up on the action items in the subsequent meeting and so on. So that, see, two things happen when you do such structured stuff. One, there is a focus. To the people who are the owners of some of these functions are also looking at it and saying that, hey, there's someone who's questioning us, someone who's looking at us, uh, you know, from a third person's view. Let's be a little careful and see what needs to be done. So the psychological impact mm -hmm. is also there. And third, some of these things yeah. get documented also in the minutes of the meeting of the company. Mm -hmm. So at later on, it protects the company, it protects the investors, it protects the board. And there is also that which happens very clearly as a part of the documentation. So it serves multiple purposes. Uh, and, and, and I think I would start. Yeah. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. I think um, you kind of nailed it, I thought. Um, so I think one thing which is coming very clearly is so structure. Let's not get too carried away with structure is what you're been saying, right? So it's not that we need uh, five independent directors, three committees, you know, two CFO, whatever, you know, one CFO, one. It's not that or one internal auditor for sure. You can always get good people to work at you, it's do smart contracting. You can avoid all those huge fix for the stay business focus. But ultimately, a company has to survive to be governed. To govern, you need to survive, right? If I if I if I have no business, what will I govern? I think that's what is coming out. From what you're saying, essentially, you need to drive your business. But in doing so, you need to take care of your stakeholders much the same way as the bigger organization do without maybe that kind of a structure, but pretty much kind of address their needs also. I think that is, that is the one which is a point which has come through. Um, so I do not have anything in particular. I'll just read some other questions and to see if we are kind of answered. So at least again, say... Is the identification of the profitable sector and diverse, diverse from area sector not working? So Satish's point is probably from the point of view of, of the company, or is it from the point of view of investor? Um, uh, investors, they would invest in different sectors if they are money or private. Not strategic investors would obviously invest in adjacencies. They won't invest, in, for example, if you are in a pharmaceutical industry, you won't invest in a hotel, obviously. You will invest in maybe API, maybe biotech. You will invest in adjacencies around the, um, you know, along the life sciences uh, vertical. But if you're talking about a company, yeah, I take your point. I think if you're talking about companies making some investment, not working, don't keep sinking cash into it and burning cash, I think that makes a, that's a good point. As Ramki said earlier, uh, there's another thing which doesn't happen too well, in my opinion, with privately funded companies. Um, in listed company, because of the pressure um, and the impact that the stock price takes because of any action, which is immediate. So the reaction or the response is also immediate. In a private company, there is nobody is marking you. Nobody is marking you or pricing you daily, right? So as long as an investor is willing to invest, the money sometimes keep uh, coming in. And then suddenly it stops. Both are wrong. So, yeah. So, and uh, any other questions I didn't? Yeah. Within the pharma nowadays, diversification into other products like API to formulation, bang on. And uh, to biosimilars, to biotechnology, a biotech is growing very fast, or to pesticides and R&D business. Completely agree. So this is a strategy that can help business, um, you know, be afloat. And uh, when one particular division or a vertical is not doing well. But then again, if you are a startup company, there are not 20 things you won't be able to do. You'll probably start with one, take it to a particular, say, for example, R&D. You have this, a lot of startup companies do R&D and then out-license at a stage because they feel they don't have enough money to commercialize. That's a good strategy. That's a good strategy to have. You develop something and then out-license. You don't have to take it to market. Because you may not have the value. It's better doing this than taking entire risk, going to market, not having resources and failing, right? So I think be loyal to what one can do and, uh, you know, calibrate the risks um, in, 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 in kind of being able to do that well and manage those, those risks. 
So I think I'm over, it's over from my side. I'm keeping the kept the time also fairly well. If there are any specific questions, we can take. Um, otherwise, we can wrap it up. So it looks like no further questions. So yeah. Okay, but anyway, we have taken all the questions on the go, so we didn't wait until the end. So, wonderful, Ramki, thanks a lot. Uh, uh, Sharat, would you like to, Sharaji, would you like to say a few things uh, and then I can wrap up? No, no, basically, he summed up so clearly. Sure. Today, we are fortunate that each of the speaker contributed to the overview and each of them, we have to request them to come for a detailed session. And of course, money, sure. I learned a couple of things in modulating and moderation. Also, in supplementing yes. also. I appreciate money. Uh -huh. Good job. You are I doing. learned from you. No, yeah. Phenomenal, sir. Phenomenal. Ram, Ramki sir, thank you. Proud to see a colleague doing and marathon thing. Of course, I am uh, 64. I can't aspire to, <laughs> but I aspire to be fit enough like you, taking cue from you. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thanks for the oh, opportunity. Yeah. Yeah, so very quick uh, wrap up, Ramki. So this is the uh, the one which is on the screen is the uh, small token of affection from us. And it will be mailed to you. Is, is that the right thing, uh, Shankar? How will it yeah. be sent? It will be courier, yeah. sir. Like a courier, sorry. I'm sorry. Mail doesn't, physical mail. Yeah. 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 Email. Yeah. Hey, he'll, he'll, so, we'll ensure you'll receive, sir. No, yeah, sir. okay. Thank so, you. yeah, that is one. And, and thanks a lot, Ramki. I think a good session. Just to do justice to that, let me just sum up. The governance is about intent. It is not about structure. That's a beautiful point I thought you made. It's not about having Sarajji, Sharmaji, all those. Great to have them, but not necessary to have such stalwarts as employees in your company. You can always have them as advisors and shared uh, service providers to your firm. Look at what you can do versus, uh, and try to do that well, versus trying to tick 100 boxes and failing in all, right? And uh, be business focused, but try to do the simple things, internal control, insulate your top line, identify this, I think the point on the revenue recognition, do basic things, right? Revenue recognition, you know, doing the basic compliances. Um, and when it comes to IPO, obviously you'd elevate your governance at that point of time. And uh, all steps should be tangible. And uh, the intent, above all, is the most important thing. So thanks a lot, Ramke. It's, as usual, wonderful speaking and learning from you. You're a very dear friend. And hope to do such sessions with you more often. Bye. Sure. Thanks. Sure. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.